We will now present the cultural history of the clinical photograph by Dr. Ambari Sathwik, a Delhi-based vascular and endovascular surgeon and director of the vascular cath lab at Sri Gangaram Hospital and professor of vascular surgery, Gripmer. He is the author of the critically acclaimed 2007 novel, Perinium, Nether Parts of the Empire, a subversive and deviant sexual history of the British Raj. Khuble, I'm delighted to be here in these very idyllic environs. And I thank Mary and the entire organizing committee for inviting me. I'm just going to issue a, a prefatory warning uh, that this is a, a fairly graphic presentation and uh, contains some medical imagery. Uh, so if you are in any way adversely affected by medical or surgical imagery, or perhaps uh, a slight of a, uh, a little bit of blood, uh, you would be well advised to leave at this point. I saw a couple of children running around. I don't think it's suitable for kids, but otherwise, we're good. Thank you. There was a time when I was enthralled to a photograph of syphilitic noselessness. It was a late 19th century photograph of a young woman, quite clearly patrician, and I remember being bewildered by the operatic calamity that was a hole in her face. The external nose was completely absent following an ulcerative destruction. Most of the nasal septum had been eaten away. What could be seen were the triangular bony rims of the nares. Her noselessness marked her body as corrupt and dangerous, as a legatee and keeper of syphilis, it warned against the quality of her flesh, against her virtue, or that of her husband's. Nevertheless, her eyes were still lambent with the pride and assurance of the well-born. It seemed as though she occupied a world of Victorian moral fiction. The photograph was from the collection of the surgeon Jonathan Hutchinson, registrar of all things syphilitic. This is not that photograph. This is from a film series called The Nick. In the accompanying text to the photograph, Jonathan Hutchinson would warn that the woman's sunken nose would be transmitted to her newborn, who would, from infancy, carry the insignia of corruption in the form of peg-shaped teeth, saddle nose, saber shin, and blindness from clouded corneas. She was in an old book, crumbling at the edges, that belonged to a particularly misanthropic professor of surgery of mine. I can no longer be sure if the photograph was indeed a photograph or a picture of a daguerreotype or even a watercolor illustration. I remember her as a sitter in the great continuum of Victorian portrait culture. In my recreation after all these years, I haven't added features to her face or diminish them, or change the angle from which I see her inside my head. In the inner cinema, her form, structure, face, and personality are exactly what I first encountered on Hutchinson's plates years ago. What I remember like a mnemonic is her diseased noselessness. What tugs at the margins of memory is the traffic carried on her face. This, ladies and gentlemen, is perhaps the first photograph of a pathological condition ever taken. Woman with Goiter by David Octavius Hill. But this isn't a clinical photograph because he wasn't a physician. By definition, a clinical photograph is taken or commissioned by a physician and it expressly concerns itself with the documentation of the clinical presentation of a patient. This man started it all, Hugh Welch Diamond. He made his first photograph in April 1839 
only three months after Talbot's famed demonstration of the photographic process. Diamond was a pioneering psychiatrist appointed in 1848 as superintendent of the female department at the Surrey County Asylum. From 1848 to 1858, he made photographs to document the facial expressions of patients suffering from mental disorders there. He believed that a patient's mental state was expressed in her physiognomy or facial features, and he claimed that these photographs would form a visual taxonomy of these disorders. Taken in Victorian England at the dawn of photography, this was perhaps among the first photographs of an individual with a mental illness. Did Diamond actually uncover physiognomic characteristics of mental illness? Physiognomy is the study of facial features. Facial features, bodily form, external appearance, as indicative of a person's character and state. Was there some association between the dark, disturbed minds of his patients and their physical appearance? Or did his interpretations rely on long-standing cultural motifs and long-held narrations of mental illness? The photographer, according to Diamond, and these are his words, catches in a moment the permanent cloud or the passing storm or sunshine of the soul and thus enables the metaphysician to witness and trace out the connection between the visible and the invisible. These photographs are not annotated, so it was left to the viewer to be the clinician or the metaphysician and figure out what this woman's smile and perhaps her stance reveals about her. Does her appearance indicate a state of madness, a return to health, or does it indicate a disagreement with society's parameters of stability and sanity? This man, wearing the highest French order of merit, is Jean-Martin Charcot, the world's first chaired professor of neurology. He's widely acknowledged as the founder of modern neurology and set up the department at the Petit Salpetrier Hospital in Paris. There, he incorporated visual art into his daily practice of neurology. Photography was at the visual center of Charcot's clinical method. The Salpetria was the general hospital for women, or as they were considered, the feminine dregs of society. It was where the neurological detritus of society was admitted. The brain sick, the batty, the screechers, the catatonics too transfixed to know they were vomiting or had shit themselves. In 1862, this man, Charcot, was put in charge of the service concerned with epileptics and hysterics. And this is his team. Under his authority and tutelage, a photographic service at the Salpetria was established and patients were regularly photographed as part of their neurologic evaluation. While those with fixed neurological findings were photographed only once or twice from different angles, the photographers became increasingly capable of documenting hysteria and epilepsy with sequential and time-lapse photography. Charcot often spoke of his enterprise in grandiose photographic language. I observe and I do nothing more. I am a photographer, he would say. The South Metria photographs were printed on positive silver plates. Thousands of them were produced during Charcot's career. Charcot's spectacular studies of hysteria drew crowds to his Tuesday afternoon matinee lectures. It would be a lecture demonstration where hysterical attacks of women were witnessed, studied, photographed, and reinforced. In Charcot's salons such as this, all kinds of people would show up. Degas, the painter, was often there. A woman would be brought and hypnotized, and Charcot would strike a tuning fork and she would go into a catatonic state, or she'd scream or faint. The demonstration and the photographic documentation were central to how Charcot made sense of the disease and how he made a name for himself. The photography was restricted to the wards, though. 
One of Charcot's most studied and photographic cases was that of a 15-year-old girl, Augustine, who was admitted to the Salpetria for sensory loss in the right arm and attacks of severe hysteria preceded by pains in the right lower abdomen. Augustine was the star model for Charcot's theory of hysteria. She figures prominently in the albums of this book. She was like a living work of art, and she was given special status and special attention by Charcot. Charcot catalogued four distinct phases of grand hysteria, the tonic, the clonic, passionate attitudes, and delirium. He photographed each spectacularly visible symptom. Spasms and crises, paralysis and anesthesia, exaggerated emotions and hallucinatory fantasies, with photography and hypnosis, Charcot and his associates documented and reproduced these symptoms, bringing on crises with bright lights and loud sounds, prodding, electric current, and the administration of ether. His cures also relied on the same intense and triggering technologies, hypnotism, electrotherapy, magnetism, and ovarian compression, what in our times would make him a proper charlatan and a quack. Charcot's experiments are a fascinating entry in the annals of the construction of knowledge, and all of this has been properly photographically documented. Under his orchestration, women's bodies were treated as rag dolls for the scientific and epistemic curiosity of researchers dressed in suits. Therein lie the origins of neurology as a discipline. This was a strange book published in Paris in 1862. Few copies were produced, and the text was accompanied by about 100 original photographic prints, each of which had to be pasted physically into the album. The title of the book could be translated into English as The Mechanism of Human Facial Expression, or an electrophysiological analysis of the expression of emotions. This man, who was actually performing the experiment, Duchenne, was the other famed neurologist from Paris. His book, which I just showed, was a chronicle of the first experiments in the electrical stimulation of facial muscles to induce expressions. In his preface to the volume, he says, using electrical currents, I've made the facial muscles contract to speak the language of the emotions and the sentiments. It is a grand project. To study and discover the mechanism and laws of human facial expression, I will not limit myself to the formulation of these laws. I will demonstrate the art of correctly portraying the expressive lines of the human face, which I shall call the orthography of facial expression in movement. Photography was used to record the fleeting effect of electricity on the facial muscles, which Duchenne claimed was so transient that it had not been possible for even the greatest artists to grasp the sum total of their distinctive features. The terror on the face of this old man has been electrically induced. It was not associated with any other physiological signs of distress. Duchenne was not concerned with facial morphology, but with the semiotic meaning conveyed by individual and groups of facial muscles as they portrayed particular emotions. In his notes, Duchenne records that the emotion of frank joy is expressed on the face by the combined contraction of the muscles zygomaticus major, which is surrounding the lips and the mouth, and the inferior part of the muscle, orbicularis oculi, which is on the outer aspect around the eyes. The first, the zygomaticus around the mouth, obeys the will, but the second one, the one around the eyes, the muscle of kindness, love, and agreeable impressions is only put into play by the sweet emotions of the soul. Fake joy, the deceitful laugh, cannot provoke the contraction of the latter muscle. 
That's one way of identifying a fake smile. Duchenne noticed that the isolated contraction of one of the muscles moving the eyebrow always produced complete expression on the human face. It was the muscle that portrayed suffering. This is again from his notes. As soon as I induced the electrical contraction, the eyebrow took on the form that characterizes this expression of suffering. But incredibly, the other parts of the face, principally the mouth and the nasolabial fold, also appeared to undergo a profound change in order to harmonize with the eyebrow and portray this suffering of the soul. One of the questions that Duchenne was trying to answer was the following. If the disparate muscle fibers merge into each other at least partly, then what spirit makes an individual muscle contract on some occasions, and then on others what converts all the muscles of the face into a mask capable of exhibiting all the feelings of the soul? This is Duchenne trying to induce the spectrum of expressions encountered in Shakespeare's Macbeth electrically. In the end, he wanted it to be remembered as an aesthetic project, to formulate rules to guide the artist in the true and complete portrayal of the movements of the soul on the face, to correct, as he put it, the wavered course of French painting and sculpture so that they may never waver in their verisimilitude. Surgeons seized in photography for its diagnostic and documentary functions roughly around 1865, and then started framing surgical discourse around it. In order to explain what the clinical photograph has since become, I'd like to introduce Hoshadar Tata, professor of surgery at the small provincial medical college where I studied. He was my lord and master for three years, but that's, uh, and he was, uh, my, he was my lord and master for three years during my residency. No man is a hero to his valet, but that's not because the hero is not a hero, it's because the valet is a valet. He was probably the fastest knife south of the Vindhya Mountains. He could shell out a prostate in approximately eight minutes. It was an astonishment to behold. But more importantly, he was a manic record keeper. Actually, his residence kept his records for him. He would photograph every lesion. This was some of the instances where he'd get everything photographed. Lesions of the tongue and the anal verge, great fungating tumors, fecal and urinary specimens in all sorts of merry colors, aneurysms at the point of rupture, unsightly fistulae, bony deformities, yawning wounds, congenital malformations, indeterminate genitalia, bronchoscopically retrieved foreign bodies from all kinds of places, extracted bullets, hernias where you'd least expect them, etc. It was a kind of portraiture for him a portraiture of the physically anomalous, photographs of photogenic morbid phenomena and of patients exhibiting characteristic clinical findings. In his private collection, the clinical photograph was the bastard child of the studio portrait. The patient's face was always visible regardless of the part or the condition being photographed. It was as though he did not believe in diminishing the sufferer to his or her photographed lesion. There were abstracted parts, but there was always one full-length photograph. No attempt was made to anonymize the subject. No white discs or black discs on the face. No need for draping or masking or concealment of genitalia. If a portrait is a gussied up representation of self that serves to present one's identity, Hoshidar Tata, like his precursors, was making an allowance for the morbid anatomy of his subjects. The form and structure of their pathology, their abjectness in that moment, was part of their identity. 
Most of the chronic cases were photographed in the Rembrandt lighting of the far end of Ward 6, with the daylight falling on the subject through the window and the fill light coming in from the glossy wall tiles on the other side. Some of the photographs from his collection we had seen on so many occasions that the sitters seemed like celebrities. The purpose of any description is to provide a shared easement, to make something knowable. The point of these images and the photographs in our textbooks was to be an object lesson in clinical medicine. This is again a photograph from Hutchinson's textbook. Any swelling on the lower part of the cheek has to be a lesion in the parotid salivary gland. The process of diagnosing surgical entities we came to realize as students was basically post hoc mother wit. What the old man, Tata, called the purple cow theory of education. Which means if you know purple and if you know cow, then you know a purple cow when you see one. It amounted to a form of visual literacy. Harking back to a cardboard mounted old photograph from his acute conditions folder, I was able to diagnose as a first year rookie a case of Ludwig's angina in the casualty. Ludwig's angina, also known as Morbus strangularis, is a rapidly spreading, life threatening abscess involving the floor of the mouth. It has the potential of internally strangulating the airway if allowed to ripen unchecked. In the imperishable words of Wittgenstein, the limits of my language are the limits of my mind. All I know is what I have words for. For physicians and surgeons, those limits are laid down by what they've seen. And in many instances, it's from clinical photographs. Perhaps every clinical image I have seen is seared in my memory. Those anomalies have been stunningly made real in my mind. Reviewing the inner cinema, it isn't atypical that a photograph is a mnemonic or an aid to memory for a clinical condition. The eye cannot see what the mind doesn't know. My professor Hoshidar Tata has passed on, and I find myself consumed by the urge to prey upon his archives, his cabinet cards and his slides, private journals, surgical ward records, operative photographs, pathology records, etc. A harvest of a little over 35 years. Absolutely wonderful as objective documents and as aesthetic objects and as purple cows. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We now invite Anis Norona and Don Scobar Junisha Kongwir to the stage. Okay, uh, you can. Uh, Ambarish. offer your reactions to Ambarish's presentation and further interact okay. with him. Anis Norona is a freelance photographer, filmmaker and content writer. In her free time, she likes listening to music, stories and sounds of the forest. Don Skubar Janisha Kongwir is an educator and a visual artist. She's an, in an assistant professor at the Department of Mass Media, St. Anthony's College, and is also the curator at the Northeast India AV Archive. I hand over the session to you. Can we do the session like this since it's just us? Or Why don't you come on? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> do you want me to be here or should I step down? Uh, we can start from here. Also. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> that was pretty disturbing towards the end. I think I hardly look at the screen because um, I think for me to, uh, I, I don't know something about the human body and uh, one thing that I noticed is that uh, you know when you started first with uh, the the uh, you know the images from Shaco, I don't know something about I think because it was you know developed in pewter plates like you know the old uh, method of processing an image mm -hmm. that it gives it that sign some kind of a softness to it and uh, you know in terms of the image 
uh, let's not talk content right now, mm -hmm. but suddenly we move into the digital form, and then where Professor, you know, your mm -hmm. guru, mm -hmm. Professor uh, Tata, Dr. Tata, yeah, yeah. Uh, suddenly, you know, digital just make it so harsh in terms of, you know, the physicality of the image. And uh, I think in the first, uh, you know, the first part of your, uh, you know, presentation with the, you know, images from that particular era of, uh, you know, in the 1820s and 30s and 40s, I think, or in the 1840s, I think that was correctly, I mean, if it's correct, that was when they started, you know, uh, taking images of uh, people with, um, you know, uh, different deformities. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, when I look at those photographs, first of all, I notice that there's just a lot of girls and women photographs, mm -hmm. and I don't know why <laughs> there aren't any men, uh, you know, of a body of a man, because mm -hmm. it looks like, you know, they're more eager to study the, the, the body of a woman rather than a man. So that's what, what I get. So I'll, I'll, I'll let Anise also now speak and yeah, uh, her reaction. <laughs> all right, thank you, ma'am. Um, well, first of all, I found, it, uh, I found it really interesting to see the shift from, you know, something that was focused purely on, you know, a psychological viewpoint with emotions, like literally a face, a muscle in the face representing a certain emotion of the soul. I find that um, quite interesting and I find that I never thought it would be captured on a photograph. It's very educational for me. And from that to the shift today of physical um, anomalies, and I was just thinking of my reaction between the two and um, the, 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 the emotional ones were, they did have an emotional impact on me, especially some with a stare and a gaze at, but the physical anomalies, they caused me to have a physical reaction. So I wanted to look away. A few I could look at, but most I could not. Uh, so it, I found it very interesting that the, the physical anomalies caused the muscle of my soul to twitch in my face. Yeah. So I found that the connection very, very interesting. Um, apart from that, sir, I was, it also made me wonder about the effects that these kind of photographs would have on the, psychologic, the, the psyche of a doctor, of the, 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 the photographer, and um, are there any ethics that, uh, you know, that have to be taken into consideration, like regarding, you know, the patient and, yeah. you know, things like that. Yeah, that's, that's what I've got. Thank you. Thank you for your... Uh Inputs. Well, um, I'm not here to defend uh, uh, any of uh, the work done uh, in mental asylums in Victorian England or uh, to defend any of Duchenne's work. Uh, I am sympathetic to the cause of documentation, though. And um, I think what is evident in in the early attempts at uh, creating a clinical photograph is that it violates perhaps almost all the salient features uh, that were listed by uh, many individuals who've been studying ethics and um, particularly uh, the phenomenon of objectification. So, um, uh, so uh, the American philosopher Martha Nussbaum, for instance, has listed various kind of salient features of what ca what characterizes objectification. If I remember correctly, the first is, and and then you can then uh, ascertain if it does uh, comply with those features. The first is instrumentality, which means. Um, to use another person as an instrument for the cause or purpose of another. All right? And this is morally problematic because it, I think, takes away uh, something that's fundamental to humans, which is, uh, or should be, uh, which is their status as an end in themselves. So instrumentality. Second is denial of autonomy. I'm not too sure if many of the women or many of the people in these photographs had any autonomy or sense of autonomy over their bodies. The third is inertness, 
which is partly linked to autonomy, which is, do they have agency? Uh, the fourth is fungibility. Fungibility as in, you know, interchangeability. If, if, you're, if two objects are interchangeable, they'll be fungible. Now, not for the early photographs, but for many clinical photographs, particularly surgical documentation of lesions and conditions and tumors and, and wounds and so on, uh, the objectifier and the observer is not interested in the individual. He or she is interested in, in reifying the object here, which is the tumor or the lesion. And in that sense, they are fungible. Yeah, go on, yes. Uh, so does that mean that, you know, you kind of dehumanize the human body? In well, uh, entirely, and that's one of the problems. I think to denude an individual of humanity would is greatly problematic. And, and, and consent comes in uh, into play here. I mean, uh, so f I'm just laying, I'm just giving you the lay of the land as regards where objectification c intersects with the clinical photograph. Then you've got violability, which is the idea that uh, the objectifier, and in this case the photographer or the physician or the surgeon, is in a position to violate the, the bodily and spiritual integrity of the subject, okay, by interfering with the course of the disease in that sense. Next would be ownership, which is in a sense that you treat that uh, the image as property to preserve and then pass on uh, to future generations. And, and the final would be, um, I guess, a kind of denial of subjectivity to the, uh, to the individual who is being photographed, which is that you deny the fact uh, that they might have a series of experiences, they, might, they, they, they are a sentient creature, they are you know, they can think and, and can act. And I think um, some of the early photographs and some of what uh, we end up doing even now would satisfy each of Nussbaum's criteria for objectification. Uh, to add to a couple would be reduction of the individual to their body or their appearance, or their body part, which is again a kind of objectification which would be satisfied by the clinical photograph. I forget the other question you raised, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I know I asked about like, you know, when you talk about like your practice, uh, you know, you keep looking at these images, so does that make you like, you know, moved away from, uh, you know, having any kind of, you know, emotions or, you know, you just kind of dehumanize the entire yes. I don't think the physician or surgeon is necessarily dehumanized. They are, uh, they become jaded. They're numbed and kind of anesthetized to the suffering of others. It's, it's, po it's kind of incrementally, it happens, because if you keep encountering uh, uh, suffering, you get, in a sense, jaded uh, to it. Yeah. Your response is, uh, is sometimes can, can become uh, the response of a jaded individual. Uh, I just want to ask you one question uh, I mean I, ca I I mean you know I'm a female image maker photographer and you know for me even making a simple image like consent and ethic is like you know the sensibility like this sensitivity I mean uh, it's always there you know to to kind of even just to photograph a person while a person while the person is in distress mm -hmm. uh, you know so I'm just wondering uh, you know in your uh, you know in most of the books that you've gone through, or you know, the most of the photographs that you've gone through, are there in any email, uh, female, <laughs> sorry, female photographers that you know of that have done uh, this kind of work, clinical, clinical so photography? Right. I think um, the role of the photographer has been uh, appropriated by the clinician. I, I mean, you're doing this now on your cell phones. There isn't a designated photographer for the clinical photograph anymore. Uh, there hasn't been for a while. I mean, uh, this is at the dawn of photography. Some of the archival stuff that I showed you is, so correct me if I'm wrong, when was the, um, the f I think the, the 
photography was invented in 1920s, 1830s, 1820s, 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 yeah. 1820s. The first kind of wet film photography yes. happened in the late, in, in the mid 1850s, yes. I think. The f I, I do know that uh, Kodak uh, brings out the first mass produced camera in about 1888. Yes. This is at the dawn of photography. This is the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. Uh, well into the, the 20th century, I think the role of the photographer is appropriated by the clinician. You see something, you'd want to capture it. What's, and, and therefore you'd have an, an numerous women clinicians, physicians, surgeons who have been documenting images. Uh, many of them ethically, many of them with consent. I think now it's mandatory to seek consent. It's mandatory to um, anonymize to cover facial attributes that might accord any amount, any kind of uh, recognition to the subject. Um, I, don't, I don't know whether that makes it necessarily more ethical, but allow me to submit that it's the nature of the beast. What I presented about the purple cow theory of education, that's how students learn. That's how medical and surgical pedagogy happens. It's, there's no other way of learning. I mean, one has to to realize that. And what is also clear is that um, more than ever, I, one is reminded of that incredible book uh, and treatise by uh, Sontag, Susan Sontag, uh, where she has an imperishable line that uh, an act of aggression is implicit in every use of the camera. How brilliantly stated that is. I mean, it is, and I don't think that's changed. It hasn't changed even in the age of uh, Instagram. Correct. Uh, you know, what the social media photo stream has done is that it's a perfectly curated photo stream. The attempt by every individual is to control, frame, and package their lives in the most idealized manner, in the most beautiful manner. You know, even there is an act of aggression because it's an ag it's a manipulation of reality. Uh, your self framing is an act of, of aggression, and but compare that with the clinical photograph. You, you he, these are images where you're exposed, warts and all, the worst aspect of your bodies are put on display. Your, your deformities, your disabilities, your, your wounds, your, your lesions, your, your fear, you know, all of that. So it's the exact obverse of, uh, of the framing of any other kind of photo stream, yeah. Uh, yes, I think we have somebody with a question there. Can we get a microphone behind, please? By the way, Janisha, I loved your book. I, I've purchased the book today, Thank you. Thank and you must give me a signed copy. Yes. Good evening. Right. And uh, that was uh, stimulating. I'm a doctor, 48 years in practice, retired. I'm an anesthesiologist by vocation. My wife is a pediatrician. And um, uh, what I noticed, this was very interesting because of clinical photography. And what I could see that uh, some of these uh, images that you saw, there were two types. One was the old images and the newer digital forms. And I could see people squirming. Now, you made a very rightful comment about uh, you could see some of them, some you couldn't. But I think one must realize, as you had said, that Clinical photography is a way of actually teaching our students. If you go to, say, uh, the Royal College uh, Museum in London or Workhouse, are, are you a surgeon or a? That's right. Right. I'm I'm a vascular surgeon. Yeah. Vascular surgeon. Now, if you go to Workhouse thing in uh, Charité Hospital in Berlin, you find earlier pictures like Netter's uh, illustrations of anatomy. That's how we learned um, Grey's Anatomy. 
uh, through pictures, uh, through illustrations. Uh, but what I found so interesting after all these years that those pictures that we saw, you looked at it from a photographer's point of view, both of them looked at it in a different thing. And then I began to say, wow, how clinical photograph could be so, so intrusive in thing. But for the layman here, yeah, I want to tell you, you know, we take clinical photographs. I do. All of us does. And with the advent of this smart little phone, we click everything. And, uh, but one thing is we have rules for it. We don't, we, we, number one is consent. We cover the faces. He said uh, the rules for that. Uh, the ethic, ethics are concerned. We have an ethical board in every uh, hospital who clarifies those and uh, consent. So there's a, there's a well laid out uh, consent form for it. The other thing is about, as I said, as he said, mentioned clinical photographs. We don't look at it uh, whether it's a male photographer or a female photographer. My wife sitting here takes photographs of genitalia, but that's because to, uh, she has a book which says the congenital deformations in childhood. Obviously, you'll have deformations in odd places, but we, those are not for um, the art gallery. Those are for our students. And some of these pictures could be so rare. Uh, some of them I could recognize. I was sitting, both of us, we were doing spot diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Doctors do that, you know. And uh, some of them are so rare that uh, they, would, they would tell a hundred uh, stories to it, you know. So that's my observation. When you look at uh, clinical photographs, or when we take them, we don't we don't we don't look at them as in a, in an objectified way. We look at them as uh, a gem, as an apple, a fruit, which has a lesson, and that's how we take a photograph. You know, but fascinating. After 48 years, uh, me being a doctor, that you have come shown the clinical photography in a different light and to see uh, both the media people here commenting. Wonderful. Thank you. It's been an experience. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay, we have another question here in front from Karen. Can somebody thank you so much for that comment, sir. Thank you, doctor. Oh, okay, another one. Yes, go on. Go on. Okay. Now. Yes. Yeah, I'll Please. be brief. Uh, now, we talked of two things. Uh, one is consent and second is anonymity. Uh, but uh, now we are having conditions where it is about uh, eye gaze and uh, expressions of the face. These are the problems. And now to teach and to show somebody what is a perfect eye gaze is very difficult. Because now if I have to seal the anonymity, I have to blacken the eyes and I can't show. So this is another thing now of clinical photography. Maybe we have to think how best can we express. So these things will be coming up now that we cannot just stick to anonymity. How do we, um, how do we keep the child's uh, identity and rights and yet teach someone? So these are the things that probably we have to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Thank you. That was that was really interesting for me. It's really to me. This is the first time I've ever interacted, uh, engaged with clinical photography at any level uh, in that sense. Uh, I I was reminded of um, Foucault's work, The Birth of the Clinic, and how in the 18th century there was that epistemic shift in medicine. You know, from clergymen to med doctors, and you know, to, to the birth of the clinic mm -hmm. and that obsession continues today. We pathologize so much. Mm. Um, and one of the key things he talks about is what you spoke of, of how you separate the person from the body. Mm. Uh, I wanted to ask you as a practicing doctor, uh, is that a good separation, uh, you think, to separate? I mean, is it possible? You speak about being jaded. I mean, I, I'm genuine. It comes from a place of genuine curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, is it better to see your patients as, you know, as you know, humans, or does it help more when you are able to separate uh, that? I think 
medicine is a humanistic discipline. And when I said that one is jaded, uh, what I meant was that one doesn't recoil from those images anymore. It's, they don't do anything to you. Uh, you don't react viscerally to it. it uh, I didn't mean that you lose compassion. Um, that, I think, is a prerequisite um, if you have to function uh, as a physician or a surgeon. Can't do without it. Uh, yes, we have a uh, Kong Mary there who wants to ask a question. Hi, Amrish. Thanks for that. I think that was a rather brave presentation to do in a literary festival. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious as to, uh, because I know uh, you have written a book as well, and what were your motivations for showing us this presentation? Or is it part of a work that you're doing? Um, yeah. Uh, it, it settles into um, a larger body of work that I'm I'm doing or considering. Uh, but I think I wish to take uh, the clinical photograph to the laity, to everyone. I think um, a, a proper introduction uh, is essential, I thought. And um, it has to be a considered aesthetic literary introduction. Uh, which is why I thought I must uh, do, do Just this. Just yeah. following up on that a little bit, I think, um, uh, you know, over the last decade or so, we've had, uh, like, really serious literature, mm -hmm. uh, like The Empress of Maladies, for example. Uh, you know, that takes us through cancer, the history of cancer. And I'm just wondering, uh, so, like for me, as a, as a non-medical person, to read The Empress of Maladies having had, and I think a lot of us have people who've, uh, uh, who've gone through cancer in, their, in our lives, uh, it helped me to understand the disease. And I don't know, but it gave me a lot of comfort. Uh, in this, when you're putting it up for the laity, as you say, uh, the clinical photography, what, how do you think the lay would, and how would it be helpful for us to engage with it? Well, this isn't clearly to assuage your uh, <laughs> your anxieties. It's going not going to do that. Uh, it is it is meant to be a disturbing presentation. There's no other way of doing this. I mean, uh, uh, so I I don't think um, it's it's an education of any kind. I don't think it's it's meant to. Uh, it's the idea is to just um, perhaps allow uh, the two realms to intersect. Um, and to also try and convey that, as um, as Dr. Sab just said, that that's precisely how medical pedagogy happens. There's no other way of doing it. This might seem uh, brutal and a violation of, of many of those principles that I mentioned, uh, but there's absolutely no other way of doing it. I didn't mean it that it was brutal. Honestly, I looked at all of it. <laughs> I don't know if that's abnormal of me, <laughs> but I was able to. But yeah, I'm just wondering, like, you know, what that book would look like when you when you come out with it. So yeah. Yes, it's the book isn't entirely on on the clinical photograph, but it, there might be a part of it that. Uh, well, I'm excited. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Is it okay? Can I Samira, just, yes. It's a short question. I just wanted to follow up on Mary's first question, actually. And I'm really curious about this, because I also work with archives. Uh, in terms of who manages uh, Tata's, the archive mm -hmm. that you've been speaking about, because it's really fascinating. And I actually find it, um, find the way that you've studied it quite rigorous. Um, but you're a surgeon yourself. So you're sort of going from within the discipline. But if it is something that you're interested in introducing to wider audiences, are you or whoever sort of manages the archive thinking about inviting possibly other other pe people from other disciplines to look at the materials? And I'm just curious about yeah, yeah. other ways of circulating. Yeah. Well, about uh, the private archives of, of professors and uh, in in medical colleges, I don't think they're meant for public consumption. Uh, I, I, I think that'll be inappropriate to, to open it up. Uh, this was just a sample, uh, I thought, um, 
to present to you uh, what contemporary uh, clinical photographs would be like. And they're not managed by anyone, they're just handed down. Uh, they stay and sit in a cupboard in the Department of Surgery or whichever department you're part of. And um, residents are invited to open those archives and go through them and, and periodically, uh, particularly when uh, ward rounds are happening or didactic sessions are happening, those are part of the slides that are used. But I, I don't think it'll be right to open it up to, uh, to everyone. I just want to um, flag some points. I'm a gynecologist, and uh, my area of specialization is sexuality education. The problem about consent with photographs is always an issue because there's a doctor-patient power dynamic where it is very difficult for a patient to refuse the doctor from taking the photograph for giving consent because the question is, will I get treated otherwise? So that consent is probably not forced, but there is some level of coercion. The second thing is that uh, I work in the area of POXO, child sexual abuse. And um, when there is uh, things like physical injuries, there has been a lot of pressure on doctors to take photographs because they say it will convince the judges better. And those photographs, if taken, for the, there are childs, so the child cannot give consent. Parents may want to not give consent, but they give it for the sake of the case. And those photographs are part of the charge sheet. That means they are stuck in the court, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the rooms where many, many people will look at it. And that entire set of papers, medical report, goes to the accused, where they can sit and look through it again. So the trauma to the child can be excessive. So that is a big controversy right now. How can we protect the child's identity without photographs? And finally, a positive aspect of photographs. I have women who come to me who don't have a uterus, MRKH. And for them, because of the lack of sexuality education in India, they don't know what lies down there. And it's very difficult to tell a patient, put a mirror and see. Because mm -hmm. like I don't know what I'm meant to see, so how do I know what's not there? Mm -hmm. And so I take the patient's consent to take a photograph on her phone and show her exactly what her genitals look like, what her anatomy is, so she is better able to understand what she has. And she keeps the photograph with her. It's hers. And it helps her understand much better. So in a way, as a learning tool, it also enhances her ability to understand her body. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Uh, anyone else with a question? OK. Adrian, I think. Thank you so much, doctor. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Dr. Ambarish, Junisha, and Anis.